auditory learners, reading, writing, and those who, who love to, to do things themselves. My other part that I would say is that I love this um, quote, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. And as I warned people yesterday during my, my class, and that was, you're going to see some slides that might be redundant, but each time you see that slide, it's, it's from a different perspective. It's from a different part of you've already seen other slides that allow you to move forward. It allows you to move past something else. And so I, I really do see that as something. So I've, I've been in the business of extraction in the cannabis industry since 2013. I've met a lot of interesting people. I've had a lot of interesting places I've been. I, I, I've been blindfolded, driven through Humboldt County, and then you arrive at some place so that you don't know where you got there, even though you're just going as long as I can get back. <laughs> Hidden fears and voices you should consider when discussing hemp. This was also in my class, but it's also true for you. I didn't like science in high school. There's no reason for me to believe that that trend is going to change today. So some of you aren't going to want to know anything about chemistry or if you want to know more about the business, and we will talk about the business, but there's going to have to be some chemistry involved. There's chemistry, physics, and mathematics, all of your favorites. I love everything about chemistry, plant science, physics, and all the applied chemical engineers and process control. Why are we asking these stupid questions when people shouldn't even be thinking about they should be breathing my air? So you have the other side of everyone that's just, I just know all about this. Why are these people asking what the best extraction is, and don't they know what ethanol is? No, they don't, but they might have a, they might have a point to their question, so you know, it's okay. I know this is a stupid question, but so first of all, I've taught 300 dietary nutritionists, you know, LPNs, and teaching them chemistry. And I, I look up like this because it was an enormous lecture hall, and none of them wanted to be there. And I had them for the Tuesday Thursday. So for in college, you know, the Tuesday Thursday classes were 90 minutes. 90 minutes of I don't want to see you. I don't want to be here. And so there are no stupid questions because I've also taught pre-med students and they are the kings and queens of stupid questions. I don't know why I got a 93. I think I should get more points. No, that's a stupid question. Get out of my office. I do not know anything about chemistry and what's the best extraction and how do I get to know more about hemp without doing any work. So that one's going to take a little bit of time. So how do I know all these things that I talk about and I'm so flippant about? And that is because every morning I get up and I study for an hour to two hours every morning. So call it six out of seven days, I get up and I study. I studied this morning since two because I had to write the presentation. That gave, me a, that gave me a couple hours up on you or else you were just going to bed at the same time. <laughs> so let's talk about hemp and let's talk about over-the-counter and prescription. So, over-the-counter medicines are minor ailments, ingestions, you got a headache, you're coughing, you go down the aisle. If you're from the United States, anyone here not from the United States, and Canada doesn't count because it's northern United States. Just kidding. All the Canadians. Anyone outside the United States? No. So if you go outside the United States and you turn out and you go to a pharmacy, there's not six and a half aisles of the same Advil and other things in different sizes, different bottles, different formulations, liquids, solids, tablets, you know, capsules. They don't have that thing. They have, this is the pain reliever, buy it. And so in the United States, we do have that. And it's usually um, not formulated to be strong enough as a prescription counterpart. So you can have things that are, that are um, you know, in, in, in uh, Canada, you can pick up your caffeine, I'm not caffeine, you can pick up your, um, what? Yeah, you can pick up your coding, the other C word. Thank you very much, John. I always have people that know what they're talking about in the front, front, so I know what I'm doing. So you pick up codeine, but you're not picking up codeine in the United States. I mean, I've gone across the Canadian border. I grew up in Vermont. We went up and got our codeine. We also went up and got our DMSO. Anyone know what DMSO is? Yes. And I would put it on my ailments and stuff in the United States. That's illegal because you die. And so, um, because you can put it on and you can put metals right into your body. It's a great solvent, it's a universal solvent. And, um, or as I always said, um, if you have a universal solvent, what do you keep it in? <laughs> Just think about it, let it settle in. And so, 
It's also, you don't need a doctor's order. You can purchase it at other places, and you can give it to friends. Okay, friends and family, almost sounds like marijuana in the old days, but not the same, because that's not the same over the counter. It is over the counter, but it's a different story. So if you go back to it, you can do that. When you go to a prescription, make sure I do the right one. There we go. You go prescription, it treats specific ailments. Someone's taking some time to ask you what you have, what you're taking, what else you're taking, what other ailments you have, so you don't have things that go against each other. It's qualified, licensed medical professionals and all those different things. And then you also go to a place where someone's been trained in pharmacy and you go to them and they count it out and they make sure everything's the same and then they bill you. A prescribed medicine's intended for a specific patient and can't be given to someone else. That's the difference. So now, how does that work into the FDA? Now that most of us are in the United States. FDA, I took this right from their website, so you're welcome to get it. I, and I always, I'm big on, on references and I'm big on the fact of scientific data. So you're welcome to whip out your camera, which is sometimes used as a phone. And when you do that, the law defines dietary supplements and products taken by mouth that contain a dietary ingredient, dietary ingredients, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, herbs, or botanicals. Who would have thunk it? As well as other substances. So when you go to Whole Foods or you go to CVS or you go to a place and you want to say, well, you know, cannabis and, and CBD should be a supplement, and why do we have to have it? Doesn't have to be FDA approved. Look at every vitamin that you take, vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin B, it doesn't matter what it is. On the bottom, it says not FDA approved. So this is not the first and only thing that's sitting out there that needs to work through that process. Dietary supplements come in many forms, no kidding. Energy bars, liquids, go to CVS, go to Walgreens down the street and just look at all the different things you can have. You can have vitamins, minerals, your botanical and herbal products, amino acids, enzymes, Black cohosh, melanin, melanone, melanin, everything you ever wanted. And then you have the dietary supplements regulations. So they see a dietary supplement as a food and not as a drug. And they also go back through and say, make sure that what you're taking isn't going to conflict with what you're getting for a prescription drug. So a good physician who's looking at something is going to ask you, what else are you taking? And usually that's on the form when you go in, it says, are you taking anything else? And of course they say, I'm not taking anything out. Not me. And I am. I am taking other stuff that I'm not selling them. Because I, I've forgotten what I've taken over the last few days. If I've taken melatonin, that is something they, they probably want to know about. <coughs> and also, there's things, I know this is another shock, but there's things that are in there that are falsely claimed. So you can buy some nice natural products from China that help with male performance. I mean, you know, you know sky jumping and high jumping, things like that. But, it, it, um, but if, you, if you look at that, it turns out that it has, you, I've tested them at Waters, and, and there's other material in there called Viagra. And so that suddenly is one of their natural things that they just kind of shove that into the medicine. Other than that, everything's going great. Our supplements regulated. And this is a headline that I took from the FDA, and it says, you should know the following if you're considering using a dietary supplement, like every day that we use them. Federal law requires that every dietary supplement be labeled as such, either in a term or somehow in the term herbal supplement. So those are the things that we're talking about. Of where's that balance between um, hemp being a dietary supplement, and when is it a prescription drug? Federal law says that you have to have those things on there. And what happens in general is if the FDA sees that something's wrong or if the product manufacturer finds out that there's something that's happening in the marketplace that's not good for their patients, then they have unreasonable risk and injury, then they need to be able to tell the FDA immediately that that's had it. And you can go up on the FDA and see who they've given warnings to. It's all up there. So I encourage you that if you're wondering, well, how do I find out these things, then it, it's just a matter of going up on the web, and you can tell every single person they've given a warning to. I'm sure Kira Leaf was real pleased that day, for those of you who know that story. But it was a compliance thing, and they, they immediately recovered from it and kept moving. 
Frank there who supplements, including ads on radio and TV, falls under the jurisdiction of the Federal Trade Commission. I know that I've never seen him at 2 in the morning. Hi, you're not sleeping? No, I'm watching the damn TV. <laughs> I'm not sleeping. Are they regulated? Here's the second page. It says once it's on the market, it monitors safety. But then you don't need to tell the FDA that you've got something out there. If they see that you've done something wrong, trust me, they're going to come find you. And they're going to come find you if you're a prescription drug, too. Whether you're, um, if you're in India, they're going to come find you in India. They're going to come find you if you're Teva in the United States. They're going to come find you if you're a mutual pharmaceutical that was in Philadelphia back in their late 90s, and they shut them down. Because, I know this is a shock, they were falsifying data. So I worked for Waters Corporation, and, and the instrument that they were using, and the data package they were using, wouldn't allow you to, to break into that software, and that's why the FDA loved our, our software. And, um, and, and yet their results weren't exactly the same as what they had, so what they would do is they would take the results, photo, um, you know, just uh, photograph them, what am I trying to say, copy them, and, uh, and then they would change them, and then they would do that. The other thing that you can do on a generic pharmaceutical, there's nothing wrong with generic pharmaceuticals, but it's called pass until you get the right answer. Oh, 0.3, it should be 0.3. I'll, I'll test it again, I'll test it again, I'll test it, I'll test it on another sample. Oh, it passed, everyone good, ship it. <laughs> and so when you're doing that, that's the part that you want to look. So when I'm looking at other products, I know which products, just from my experience in being in so many companies that I can't tell you about, that I know which natural products I'm buying at the store. So if you want to follow me around and go, I didn't pick that one. Because I know they tested it, and I know what their QC procedures are versus I think it's good. Look up fish oil. Look up omega-3 sometime. There's, a, there's cheaper ways to get olive oil into your body. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so, can CBD be a dietary supplement? This is says this morning, what's today? Is today the 14th or 13th? What is today? Is it? <laughs> Well, I saw this up on there and it said the 13th. So we'll keep it there. And this is what I saw because I know it can change every day. I don't know if you've noticed that, but the CBD world changes every day. Changes. Uh, and so the FDA continues to believe that drug approval. That's good. This is like good night moon, just in case you can't read. Good night. Where's the mousey? How many people know good night moon? Yesterday, not that many people. How about, how about good night gorilla? Oh, good night gorilla even better than good, you've got to get good night gorilla. Because you can follow the mouse, you follow the balloon. There's so many things to follow, it's crazy. It's so I, I, I read it all the time, and I, and I only have grandchildren. And I don't read it to them, I just read it before I go to bed. Go to so anyhow, I go back to, oh, okay, I'm back on track. So the FDA continues to believe the drug process represents the best way to help ensure the safe and effective new medicines, including drugs derived from cannabis are available to patients in need of appropriate medical therapy. The agency, <coughs> with a capital A, is committed to supporting development of new drugs, including cannabis, cannabis-derived drugs, through investigative new drug and drug approval process. We are aware, kind of know that they're reading the papers, we are aware that there may be some products on the market that add CBD to our food or label CBD as a dietary supplement. Under federal law, it's currently illegal to market CBD this way. Or just happen, it's just too many of them. And so um, that that is the FDA stance. That is from there, from that reference. So at the same time, knowing that as long as people act well and they self-regulate, they're, they're going through. I know that some of you are late, so I put in this slide a quick recap. I'm a substitute teacher, I'm not the person that was here before. Okay, for those who walked in late, you either love or hate science. We're all good with that. Everyone else is going, oh my god, why can't they just be on time? You know, the <laughs> products are already behind or in front of the counter. The FDA, USDA, and historical definitions, not natural products. And now we're going to talk about natural products. So we're moving on. For those who came in late, we all good? And for those who came in late, because this is my favorite slide, so nobody walks in the same river twice, where it's not the same river and he's not the same man. Okay? So if you look at CBD today, and that's why I study every day, I study every day because it changes every day. And everything I'm reading changes every day. And so people all, often ask me, well, what do you read? I read scientific literature. I read all the things that are open access, just like you can. And I read patents. I love patents. And the reason I love patents is because the introduction to a patent is fabulous. 
It is like the most amazing thing if you want to learn about extraction, if you want to learn about biopharmaceutical, how you do fermentation and yeast. It's a great intro, and they give you all the references, because when you write a patent, you tell everything that's ever been done, how you're more wonderful and different, okay? And then you can read that part. That's usually the bullshit part, but it's not, not, not really, I didn't mean that. I mean, it's the part that can be more um, creative. <laughs> so from seed to shelf, this is what typically happens, and when I say that it's a scientific process, this is typically what we do in a scientific process. We have a natural product research, we identify the unknowns, we do structural elucidation, we isolate, we purify, and we figure out how it actually works. That seems like a good idea. And then we do product development. We do in, uh, ingredient profiling, we do method development, method validation, making sure what we have in there, QA, QC, what's the product coming in, COAs, we know all those other things. Then we do quality control, we identify, purify, we find out the strength, the composition, we do process monitoring. And then post-market, we do lots of adulteration, contamination. We all remember Tylenol, the bad things that can happen and what can happen when people put in, you know, when you have bad stuff in, in peanut butter like E. coli or something. And then you have label claim. So where are we in the hemp CBD market? Well, we skipped this part. <laughs> that seems silly. And so we moved right over to, you know, product quality control. We're now shipping products. And what's happening now is you are seeing a lot more of things going back to this, and I encourage anyone, no matter what the hemp industry is, trust God, everyone else bring data. Someone gives you a COA, you do a COA. Do a COA every time you get more product coming in, or if you're making tinctures, you're doing stuff, do another one. As much as that last COA was good, mutual pharmaceutical comes to mind, just keep testing until it gives you a class, you can still go out and do some of the testing, at least on potency, to make sure what you have is what you're providing for the next store. Step. <laughs> Someone gives you seeds, test the crop. None of, the, none of these have any THC. So I've been in Vermont, and I had 100 little plants, and it was, it was really, really cold. And I tested, you know, the first four or five, and point, you know, it was point one, point, it was only like a three-week-old plant. So I know how to test a three-week-old plant. Um, so if you have blue eyes when you're three, you're going to have blue eyes when you're 30. If you have a certain amount of THC at, at three weeks, you're going to have the same percentage as it grows. The amount may be different, and it may vary a little bit, but you're going to know. So I was 0.3, 0.0, 0.1, 0.1, 0.03, 5.2, 4. And of course, we took that plant and said, oh, that's a baddie. We tested it again to make sure it was, and it was. It was like five points, whatever the seed was on that one. And then we did some more, and we found out out of the 100, there were three that were high in THC. <coughs> So in Vermont, if you have something in your hemp and you have to get rid of those plants, so I looked at the guy and said, well, I've got to get rid of these plants. He said, that's all. <laughs> oh, hey. Took him in the back room. I'm sure he destroyed them. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> not my job. And so I go back through, but each one of these is what you need to test all the way through the process. And you can do that through, you know, through testing, even through thin layer chromatography. All right, so what is pharmacognosy? Because I'm sure that's why you came, because it was in the title. How many know, people know about pharmacognosy? Oh, bummer. No one? Someone? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Oh, oh, so if I go back through, um, I'm not sure I can pronounce it, but I'm likely to come in the conversation my next Uber, Lyft, or taxi ride. Pharmacognosy was before pharmacology. Pharmacognosy was everything that people were trained on until the early 50s, late, late 40s. It was what the science was. You had medicines, and you had natural medicines, and you had plants, and that's what you studied. And then small molecule came in because of the flaminamide, of some of the other things that happened on this, and not being able to regulate it. So they had to say, we need to make a small molecule so we're able to regulate this thing. And so that's where pharmacology came in. And then it started going through. But you had Pittsburgh, Chicago, Florida. They, they were the major places of pharmacognosy. That was the science. And then it slowly went away, and now it's come back. But that's what pharmacognosy is. And of course, after babbling, I could have just read this. So the American Society of Pharmacognosy, the study of natural products, molecules, typically secondary metabolites, that are useful for medicinal, ecological, I don't know what that word is, and other functional properties. I'm sure it has to do with gusto, so it must be Budweiser. So if I'm looking at those properties, that's exactly where it all came from. And now we're back. So
So now we're taking a plant that has some different contributions, not only that, but, but lots of contributions. So then it's, there's other things called medical ethobotany, uh, ethnopharmacology, phytochemistry, zoopharmacognosy, greens, so you can figure out the, where they came from. So each one of those parts still comes through. You're still getting things out of the, out of the, what are the things that come out of the ground that are really hot? A gla not glacier. Um, geysers. Another G word. Thank God. Make sure someone tells me what time it is so that I, I have enough time for 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> As Bob um, Newhart used to say, after about 30 minutes, people start to congregate together and they start to rush to the stage. So I'll know when 30 minutes is up. So as I go back through, that's where you have all the different capabilities of what hemp is. It's right back to pharmacognosy. This is what the, the older people like myself know. So here's the Pacific yew tree. Oh, someone's already crying. Uh, Pacific yew tree, fungus, willow bark. Anyone know what? Uh, we'll start off with the willow bark. That's the easiest. Aspirin. Ah, perfect. It's a small molecule. We don't. I'm getting a headache. I'm not going to gnaw on a tree. Okay. I'm going to have a toothache. So, how about this one? Quinine. Quinine. Helps with my restless legs. Makes a great drink. <coughs> how about fungus? Penicillin. Penicillin and any of the other things, yeah. So that's what we do, and then the yew tree is usually the hardest. Taxol. Taxol. You know what taxol is for, sir. Started off a lot with breast cancer and such. But the reason we don't, so I then had the answers to give, but I forgot them. No, I knew what they were. So um, if I go through these, we did taxol because we're going over to China and we're taking down trees to get a little bit of taxol out. And so we synthesize taxol. We synthesize aspirin. It's a lot cheaper to get aspirin than to start extracting willow. Daffodils. Well, so we know that we're on other things besides hemp. Anyone know what you're, how you're not supposed to put daffodils into the same base? with um, uh, tulips and roses. Anyone know that? Oh, wow, I love that. When I come up with a slide, it kills them. <laughs> so what happens is it comes out, it has stuff that falls out the bottom, and it goes over and will kill your tulip. The tulip's going, no, no, not him, don't play with it. <laughs> so if I go back through, that's more like the roses, because what happens is the sugar comes out, of the daffodil and it goes over and then it and then it makes bacteria on the roses and then the roses die because it closes up and it can't get any water it's going so that's what you have so that's what you can look and when your people are saying what do i have other things hemp will grow next to pear trees it loves pear trees oh it just loves pear trees you get it next to some other plants and the, and the hemp is going i don't want to be here and it tries to move away you'll find the one where the roots are kind of moving away it's like oh my god so it will, but there's different things, and that's what plants do. Plants like to talk to each other. This is called bioprospecting and bioprivacy. piracy. I found this one this morning. This was not one of the slides that I was thinking I was going to put in. But it turns out that if I, and I was there last, last year, I got a letter, I got a letter from the king of Bhutan that allowed me to go all the way through Bhutan and grab all the different cannabis that I wanted. But I had to have a letter from the king. It's not as though you go into Bhutan and start plucking up cannabis. That's a good way to die. But it's also, it's illegal there. It's illegal in China, right? But they're the largest growers of hemp in the planet by far. But it's illegal. That doesn't mean they can't sell it. So imagine you were 10 years old and you discovered by trial and error that when you scraped your knee, your mom's marigold plant, your knees stop hurting and heal quickly. You share this knowledge with your friends and eventually your friends, it just becomes your family lore and your best friend goes up to be a research scientist at a prestigious international pharmaceutical. She develops a process and she's extracting it and now they patent it. Do you have a lawsuit? Turns out you don't. But it's a nice paper by this woman. If you go back through, it's her paper when she was in Chicago, like 2007 or something like that. But what is, you can go into a country and steal their plant and then come back out and make a drug. You can't do that to every country. You can't just walk into a place and just start stealing their material any more than you could for Bhutan. So at Bhutan, I, I said, close your borders. My presentation was, close your borders. But um, 
and they, they did, they, they, they went off and gave a contract to, to another company, which was probably this as well, and so they can't go in and start stealing their genetics. Why Bhutan? Oh, that's a good question. Because there's no Californians there. <laughs> there's no one there taking the plant. I'm going to make myself a lot of THC. That's not exactly how Californians go. I'm going to, I'm going to like, um, take a plant, and I'm kind of like, I'm going to get a lot more THC out of it. And so that's what they would do, but they didn't do it. They were beautiful plants that were really strange, and they had great, interesting chemistry. And I, I, I can never tell you what it is. So some needs is going to come out from under there and kill me. So applied chemistry, more chemistry. So what does hemp do? I say use the whole pig. Use the whole pig. Use the stalk. Use the roots. Use the flowers. Use the leaves. Because there's all kinds of different types that you use. When Eastern Europeans look at us, they think we're nuts because they grow a lot of this. And they make hempcrete. And they make rope. And they make clothing. Okay, why was the rope used for, for the hemp? It was used on the ships that sailed over because the salt didn't, didn't erode it. That's why you used hemp. It, was, it used to be, you used to have to grow hemp, I think, in Ohio. It was, if you didn't grow hemp, it would be legal. You had to grow hemp. And you had to grow it because you needed rope. And there's seeds and there's other parts that go that. It's the highest protein source as far as the seed. All right? Every once in a while I look at you and I think, is this new information or you're just like, oh my God, Lisa knows it. <laughs> so cannabis is also, there's a difference between synthetic cannabis and cannabis that you make. So if you look at um, um, different types, there's what, what we do is, as a chemist, I don't know what time it is, what time is it? 9.37. Oh, I have a couple minutes, huh? And so if I go back through, I look at this, it's where I'm making something that's the exact same molecule, but if I start to head towards how do I go across clinical trials? If you want to say, I don't know anything about clinical trials, you, if you have a computer, go to this website, clinicaltrials.gov. Type in CBD. It will tell you every single clinical trial that's, that's on the web that's, been, that's being documented. You will know the source of it. So I just took this, I took this screenshot, there's cannabidiol, very clever, and that's what I came up with. Equally as clever. 209 trials are going on currently. It will tell you the status of every single one, what country they're doing, who did it, and what's the status. So if you want to know information about that, that's where you find it. Systematic review of can of, uh, dosing. How do I know about dosing? Type in dosing. Go to something, semanticscholar.org. And it was done by Paul Allen. It goes through all the pub meds. It goes through everything. It's a very fast thing, and it only looks at those semanticscholar.org. And I type in that, and that's what I come up with. There's conclusion to this enormous review, says, the review highlights the CBD has a potential wide range of activity in several pathologies, pharmacokinetic studies, as well as conclusive phase three trials to elucidate effective plasma concentrations with medical context is severely lacking and, and highly encouraged. Who would have thunk it? Hemp is an agricultural product. Just in case those who didn't know about that. And these are two places you go to the web. Go to this one, U.S. Domestic Hemp Production Program. And so even though you're not growing it, you can find out all the different things about that. And it gives you the resources. And down here, there's a webinar on the new, on the new laws that just came out and what they're doing and how they're being used as a review time until the end of 2020. And so if you look at that, it does that. Click on that. It's a nice little seminar for about eight minutes. You have a lot of information at your tools every morning you can study for 15 minutes. And then you can also go over here and it says subscribe to updates. Click on that, put your email in, and that way they can track what you're doing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They will send you updates and track what you're doing. But, the, uh, but that's what you do. You can go to that one. This is the Botanical Drug Development Guidance for the Industry, December 2016. You go to that one. You find out all about what the hemp products are. It also tells you it's this botanical product. It tells you when you should have an isolate, how many times you have to grow a crop, what is good agricultural practices, what is good manufacturing practices, what are good laboratory practices. It has it all outlined in here in just a short 155 pages. But when you're looking at that, that's where they're going. And you can see the new rulings are almost a shadow on top of this. Go to the agricultural marketing service. This is why I did the email updates, and sure enough, every morning I'll get something. And it's not always hemp, but it'll always tell me something clever. Industrial crops and products. 
This is a journal. I, I do everything on peer-reviewed journals. This is another old journal. I'm and so when you look at that, you say, well, I'm really focused on that because if I was from California, not that I have anything wrong with California, just like, wow, man, I've got this really good stuff and, and it's really, really good. Well, there's a lot of other really, really good stuff in there. It's just that we have engineered it out over a few decades in basements across the United States. I don't even know what I meant by that, but I'm sure you figured it out. So if I look out, I've got lots of plants. Somehow you make an oil and somehow you put it in the tincture and you sell it. Somewhere in here, a miracle occurs, as far as I can figure. Look, I have plants. Look, I have oil. No, it doesn't happen that way. I mean, there's a few more things that have to happen in there, whether it's you're cleaning up on the waxes or you're doing other things. But also, this is where the terpenes come from. So I take the Willie Sutton thing, and that is, why do you rob banks? Anyone remember this one? It's where the money is. Okay? Why do I take the trichomes? That's where the cannabinoids are. They're not in the stocks, okay? So you want to be able to concentrate the actual um, trichomes, and that's where the cannabinoids are if you're looking for efficiency. This is the type of work that you can see that, um, oh, who did this? Uh, Mark Lewis out of NAPRO, and he's also a partner with, with Ethan Mutual along the way. But they go back through, and this is what they look at as a, as a, as a monitor of what do I have for a plant and how do I make sure that that plant is is giving me what I want. So this is the cannabinoids. This is a, uh, it's like a 17 to 1 THC to CBD. This is a 1 to 1, and this is the other side of 14% of uh, THC to CBD. And the terpenes were all the same, okay? Wildly different cannabinoids. The people that they talked to expressed that they had the same experience. The body's not having the same experience, but they are, because the terpenes are like the front wheel of the bicycle, the cannabinoids are the back wheel, they're driving things forward, but it drives the experience. So they started off with about 30 people, and now they're doing like two or 300 of John Hopkins to really find out what, what is this all about, if you can monitor the experience, but not the physiologic. Three things that I always say, no matter what you do, and I, I, I had this in the class yesterday, so everyone in the front row in the class going, oh my God, not this again. And so speed, scale, selectivity, pick two. You can use fast, you can do ethanol, you can do CO2, you can, do, you can go really, really fast, or you can have scale, or you can have speed and selectivity. You, you can't have all three. And so when you're choosing that, you also want to start to say, in my hemp business and with the FDA and with the USDA, they're looking at adding simplicity and safety. Safety is a big concern. I'm sure Jen Farm was not real pleased about what happened in Kentucky when it had to blow up and everything else. That's terrible. You don't want to have those things happen, and they had everything in charge. You're going to have OSHA involved. Trust me, OSHA's just sitting there going, and where's the safety? Where's clean in place? How do I know what my cleaning validation is? All those things are going to come into play. And I always say that you start off with your final product, and then you figure out what you do for an exception. <laughs> you start off with what I'm trying to make and have a specific solution to it, and then you move back to what ingredients do I have to have to get to that, and it could all the way go back to what you have for a chemo bar. What am I putting into the ground to be able to provide me a product that gives me the ingredients, that gives me the, the product that I have for my patients or customers? How much time have I got now? I'm over seven, so I'm over time. So I have to go backwards. Let me make my name and answer. So I always say that you have to figure out what you have for the best extraction, and that's what you're going to be doing. So as a conclusion, I would say you need to know what the product is, you need to know what you have for an extraction, what you're concentrating, it has to be safe, and you have to be constantly testing. You can't manage what you can't or refuse to measure. You know, if you've got high blood pressure, are you checking your pulse and your temperature? Rhetorical question, but... So this is what we have for cannabis. And I will find my final slide, and there it is, so that you're able to release. So you're extracting every day. You get up in the morning, you make coffee, you're extracting. If you just wanted caffeine, take a pill. Go get no dose. Why don't you go get no dose? Because you want to have bad breath when you get up. So what you have is you're having all the things. What's the difference between hot coffee and cold brew and iced coffee? That's what you're doing. It's the same thing with him. And I'm sure I haven't left any time for questions, but uh, thank you very much for your time. I don't know if Do you have time for questions? You're until 10, John. I'm what? I'm until 10? Yeah. Are you setting me up for yesterday? No, I'm in a minute.
Is there, any, is there any slide that you'd like to see again? Go back to? All right, I'll go back to this one. This one? Okay. John, for questions, yes. we have to pass out the mic or the audio doesn't pick it up. So oh. take, wait for the everybody to get the mic. So the United States has looked at this thing that says cannabis, and then it's cannabis with high THC, CBD, and, and high CBD. So when you're looking at that, there's a classification. Everything is cannabis. Cannabis is cannabis. Let's not be silly. It's cannabis. And so what happens is, is the variety has a different concentration. So if it has a high THC, well, let's say high THC, but low CBD, because that's usually what they're looking at, of those two compounds at this point in time. Then they have a one-to-one, -one, so that's a class two, or section two, or whatever we come up with two, and then there's a high CBD, and that's in quote, with a low THC hemp. So you can have high CBD and high THC, so they're gonna to have to classify something there. Why do we have the point three? <clears throat> this is, I know it didn't happen this way, but you can almost see it. You're sitting at a bar, and you're just sort of going, well, what are we gonna call that? I don't know. Point two? <laughs> Good luck. Point six? <laughs> Maybe it should be something odd. Okay, point three. Perfect! So, <laughs> But it really, there was some there was some thought process. It just it, when he, he came up with that, he didn't mean it to stick for for decades. It was more of what kind of THC would we anticipate to start to see some first um, euphoria over something else, and they came up with the point three, which is kind of how, and it just kind of stuck. Is it the right number? Who knows what the right number is? I mean, they just did it. So now you have all these different complaints in it. Complaint compounds in here with the terpenes and the mix. But that's pretty much where I see all of it going. Then you have industrial. Industrial really is class four and class five. Class five is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm of no use, I'm just the weed. And the other one is I'm, I can be used for fiber and other stuff. So that's how they'll classify it. This is extraction because you make coffee, right? So cold brew coffee takes a long time. Why does cold brew coffee take such a long time? It's, it's, it's a very slow process because you have cold water and so it's going back through and it's slowly taking out. In cold brew coffee, you have about a thousand compounds, okay? In hot brew coffee, you have about 1,500 compounds. Why does Panera, I won't say, where I'm video, why do some of the places say that they have, you know, put a time on it? because it oxidizes. So when you have the 1,500 compounds in there, some of them are coming out and there's a bitters and, and other acids, and now they're oxidizing, and that's why it starts to taste worse and worse. Here's another experiment for you. So you're making coffee in the morning, and it's a flow-through type of coffee maker, and you're gonna make 12 cups. You do the 12 cup. Take the first cup, because that's what I usually do. I just pop the first cup, best stuff. Take the first cup and you put it aside, and then you let the rest of it go. And then when it, the rest is go, you take a, a, a cup from the one that was the other, you know, 11, I was told to be no that. And so you take the one from the 11 and you drink that. And then you drink the first one. Has anyone ever done this? It tastes like gasoline. There's a reason for it. It is. I mean, because you have all the oils, you have all the things that are flushing off of the beans. It tastes like petroleum because it is. And it has all the other stuff that's in there. And so, it's not the best cup of the day. It has a lot of caffeine, I'll grant you that. But you know, it's like it's like taking the other <coughs> cup and mixing a little gasoline in there. So anyhow. Questions? Has to be a question. Yes, sir. My uh, my name is Phil Carter. Uh, I'm a practicing physician in Orlando. Oh. A couple of quick questions. If you yes. just compare and quickly contrast uh, heat extraction versus CO two extraction and relative benefits versus faults. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking of a word picture that's less than my typical five minutes because the first guy in the, at the class yesterday was going, oh God, don't, please don't ask him that. And so if I have, I'll, I'll use it as a, a separation and I'll talk about a small grading versus a, a larger grading. Okay, I'll do it that way. And the fact is, is when you have something larger and you have a bunch of you know, M&Ms and ping pongs of different sizes, more will come through that big one. And if you have something narrow, less will come through. And so when you're doing CO2, what you act, when you do ethanol, it's like the big grading. Everyone's coming through if it's a warm, if it's a warm ethanol. Everybody's coming through. It's, it's open. 
And so when you have something that's narrow, that's more like CO2, where you have the narrow ones and then you can open it up a little bit and get the other ones, open it up a little bit. So CO2 is more, is more uh, tunable, like, a, like an FM radio station. Um, ethanol is like all the stations come to me. And the other one is FM, you know. And so that's, that's the difference. And so what you have is you have more of a cleanup with the ethanol um, to be able to have other stuff. Go ahead. That wasn't my question. Okay, what's your question? Uh, heat. Heat. Heat extraction. So by definition, that ethanol extraction is heat extraction. So tell me more about heat. Tell me more about what I don't know anything about, about it. That's why I'm asking. Oh, practicing. Okay. There's nothing for, for heat. Um, it's more solubility. So I, I would, that's why I thought you were going towards warm ethanol. So no, there's nothing on, on heat. So if I was to do heat to be more like rosin or something like that, and I start to press it like an iron, that would be that would be heat. If I take um, um, camp, um, temp and I heat it, I will decarboxylate it <coughs> in an oven. That's one, but that's not an extraction. That's more of a an isomerization or a decarboxylation with a uh, carboxylic acid group. When you were thinking about the different types of compounds, what kind of things were you you're thinking about with the question? My question, is, truthfully, is uh, you know looking for you know going back to your best practice. Yes. Looking for something that's going to be least amount of um, pesticides, depending on the bulk mass that uh -huh. you're using, and, and looking for a way to come up with the, the purest, quote unquote, product. And in particular, my interest is mostly in vaporization of distillates and okay. uh, oils. Okay. Everyone else kind of want to hear that answer? Okay. All right, everyone's nodding. <laughs> so if I go back through, if, I, if I'm looking at the pesticides, so it's garbage in, garbage out. No matter what type of extraction I have, I'm going to get some pesticides if they're starting in the material. So there's some good papers. Um, a, a fellow named um, Jeffrey Raber, R-A-B-E-R, -E and he wrote a really good paper on the extraction of what comes over on the pesticides. Um, the other part is with ethanol, you're going to get all the pesticides. No matter who's in there, you're going to get mold, you're going to get pesticide. Everybody's coming over it with warm ethanol. When you have CO2, if you have mold, you're only going to get the organic molecules that made at that time. You're not going to get any of the mold. You're not going to get any of the metals because they're not coming over on CO2, especially on subcritical CO2. Um, ethanol, if you have cold ethanol, you have a chance, but you're, you're still going to get some metals because they're going to come over as a flow versus CO2 that's not, that's not going to flow over. They, they can't flow over. They're not soluble, so they, that's why they're metals in Earth's atmosphere. I hope that answered a little bit, but catch me afterwards if I haven't. Uh, yes? Uh, so a follow-up. With, with CO2, if you have metals in your biomass and you take it through a CO2 extraction, it takes the metals out? It doesn't bring the metals over. So if I guys, pull hold out... Hold on, we have to be on mic for questions. Oh, sorry. 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 So if I pull out crude with a CO2 extractor, the metals are not in the crude? The metals should not be in the crude because they're not soluble. This is not soluble, okay? So it's not coming over. It's going to stay on that side. All of it. Yeah. All of it. Thank you. I can't imagine unless you have a metal oxide or something. Calcium, I think calcium's not a metal. Anyhow. Yes. Wait for the mic from Alex, or I get in trouble. What are your thoughts on some of the new aqueous or cold fusion, as I call it, extraction systems? Mm. Can you can you ask me a different way? Aqueous extraction, pressure in the water with a solvent. Okay. So, what happens with aqueous in water? So, everyone know about ice hash, or at least heard about it. So, ice hash is a, is a way of knocking off the trichomes. So now they're not soluble, but they come over using nitrogen. Same way, you're using something cold, and, and the and the trichomes fall over. There's other ways of doing the aqueous, where you can do cavitation, kind of like ultra ultrasound. So if you do ultrasound, what you do is you break open the trichomes like cracking open an egg. Now they're not soluble in the water. So your next part of that is to separate the oil from the water further down because water is not being used as a solvent. It's being used as a media. So then you can do it also by cavitation. You can do things called venturi tubes. And so cavitation, what's cavitation? Cavitation is the, the really strong bubbles that you make that if you go from a large tube down to a small tube at that interface, with a lot of flow, it start, it's going to start to have bubbles. That's how you fall off propellers off of boats, to help people see cavitation. But you can use that same cavitation to burst open the trichome. 
Does that answer the question? Well, I understand that, but what do you think about it? Oh, what do I think about it? Scale, industrial scale. I think it's a viable option because it can be used in a, in a non-polar and polar way, like you have vegetable oil. The, the, the trick is, is now you're, is you're fracking. So you're doing fracking. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing is you have a small amount of oil and you're trying to skim it off like the Valdez off of the ocean, right? As long as you can skim that oil off, there's a lot of ways to do that through centrifugation and, and other means that the oil industry knows very well. So the oil industry, when it does fracking, it pushes water down breaks things apart, then they come up and then they separate the oil from the water. So it's it's fracking of cannabis. That's my, I think it's viable. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, you gotta wait for Alex or I get in trouble. Uh, that was a great talk, thank you. So I just wanna make sure that I can make this statement to patients. So if a patient goes to a any pharmacy or anywhere and picks up a vial CBD, if it's CO2 extracted, then I can tell the patient that they don't necessarily need a you know, ICO lab running analysis saying that it's clear of microbials, heavy metals, and pesticides. Make that statement? Or? No. No. Okay. You can't. There's a lot of people doing bad CO2. Um, so it's more of, the, of how people are doing it. So your, your process is more from your, from your education of knowing what a pharmaceutical is going to do clean in place. They're going to make sure that everything's clean in between. They're going to make sure that that that, that, that single compound or that biopharmaceutical is going to be, um, is going to be um, tested and you have regulations that you know well. That's, that's not the case in the, in the hemp industry currently because it's not federally legal, so you don't have those federal things to, to back up on your assumption. You just, you just don't. I, I trust God. Everyone else brings data. <laughs> GMP, CGMP, GAP, uh, GLP. There's so many things that have no Gs. The only G is G. I hope it works. <laughs> <laughs> I just made that up. I don't think it's appropriate, but it was kind of funny. <laughs> yes, sir. Wait, you got to get to Alex, or I get in trouble. I just keep saying I get in trouble. I used to have six fingers. That's not true. Oh my God, you six fingers. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. McKay. It was a fantastic presentation. This is a little more future thinking. Okay. Uh, extracts could probably con be considered unfinished products because there's still a lot that can be done before they end up in the consumer's hands. When we're talking about the development of biopharmaceuticals, we definitely need to incorporate a lot more pharmaceutical techniques like stereochemistry to truly unlock the potential of this plant. What do you think the barriers are for the industry in incorporating these strategies to developing products? Everyone familiar with stereochemistry? Okay, I'll do a quick uh, stereochemistry. I have a right hand and a left hand. I'm glad I got them right today. And so they're mirror images of each other, but they don't overlay. That's stereochemistry. When you take ibuprofen, you're not taking 200 milligrams of ibuprofen, you're taking 400 milligrams of ibuprofen because the FDA has decided through testing that one of the isomers is doesn't do anything and the other one brings you the relief that it says on the on the label. Okay. I didn't bring my molecules because usually I bring my molecules in a nicer. When you have when you looked at the slide from um, a soli you look at this slide here and what he's speaking about is the fact that you have delta nine, you have nine isomers of delta nine. The plant preferentially makes one at like 99.9 .9 and it makes another one at like 0 0.01. But the plant makes one very specific isomer because that's what plants do, okay? And your body only looks at one because that's what your body does. It knows what's coming down on a protein site. So if you do biopharmaceutical and you have six isomers, if this is the question that you're doing, how do you make sure it's the right isomer that your body's looking for, and therefore you have the bioactivity and bioavailability of that one isomer? So that's the challenge that medicinal chemists have versus what people have for the biopharmaceutical. When biopharmaceuticals made, they have huge vats of yeast. They are making very specific beer, in essence. So some of your biopharmaceuticals that you're buying, paying for for $800 or so, they're very expensive because they're very expensive to make. 
And so that's the part that you have. So my thought on that is they have to get the isomers right. And how do I test them? I test them by supercritical fluid chromatography with, uh, with isomers. So I have, I have a few patents, but one of the patents I have is I've separated you know, minus minus delta nine and minus plus delta nine. So there's not much difference between those two. But I separated them, and I guess I'll give a patent for anything. So if we go back through, that's, that's something very specific that the pharmaceutical companies go through. It's called enantiomeric excess. Flamidomide is your perfect example of when they put that into place. That was a terrible, terrible drug in the 50s where babies were born without arms or they were born with, it was just horrific. And what happened was they had one that they were giving to pregnant women for sleeping. Wasn't it for sleeping? I think it was for seven positions. Yeah, most morning sickness. And what happens in the brain is slowly this other minor, minor isomer slowly accumulated poison and it went down the placenta and it was horrific. Is that fairly accurate? And so when you're doing that, that's what they're doing. So Celeste is giving me one of these. She started off with this and now she's doing one of these. Because you don't listen. I mean, I don't listen. <laughs> so and thank you very much. So I hope that answered the question. But that's what it is. Thank you.